from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Please come on their seats down here. Please come down. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress, which was established in 1977 to find ways of stimulating public interest in books, in reading, and in libraries. And we have been in business for almost 25 years and have discovered many ways of promoting books, reading, and libraries, not only through affiliated centers now in 44 states of the Union with reading promotion partners with groups such as Reading is Fundamental and other national groups, uh, but also through programming here at the Library of Congress. And it's our pleasure to sponsor a series which we informally call Books and Beyond, which features uh, authors of recently published books that we strive to find a special connection with which we try to find a special connection with the Library of Congress. Uh, often the, author, the authors who are featured have used the Library of Congress's collections um, or they have other special connections. And in this case tonight, of course, with uh, Alan Kurzweil and his new novel and his own interest in books and reading in libraries, it's not hard to find a special connection with a center for the book itself because uh, his writings and the popularity of his first book, A Cabinet of Curiosities, and I think the popularity of the book, which is going to be his takeoff point for his talk tonight, uh, themselves are testimony to uh, another way of promoting books and reading and also drawing out people who have the interest, which most of you do, I think, in, uh, in books 
uh, and in reading and what we tend to call as historians book culture or an aspect of book history that also brings out special interests that uh, some people are born with. It's, if not just the love of books, it's the love of being around book, book, books and the printed word. And both of these are characteristics, I think, of Alan's uh, first two novels. Uh, the second novel, which I hope many of you have read, and if not, you'll have a chance to buy and get signed when our program is over. Uh, the Grand Complication, a novel, uh, has received, as I hope many of you realize, uh, well, wonderful reviews. Uh, I was going to show Alan a couple of the reviews that I clipped, which I can show him later, uh, not only from Publishers Weekly, which of course called it a grand, uh, engaging, playful, intellectual thriller, but one of my favorites, Alan, is from uh, Barbara Peters, who I don't know whether you know Barbara. She writes The Poison Pen. She runs a mystery bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona, and has uh, The Poison Pen uh, book news. And she uh, reads voraciously and recommends at a drop of a hat and also uh, unrecommends at the drop of a hat. But this book, uh, the, the Grand Complication, was strongly recommended. And she said she especially recommends it for anyone who enjoys a dry, sly, elegant humor, heraldry, horo horology, history, heaven. So she found all of these elements in your book and strongly recommended it. Um, Alan is currently a fellow at Brown University's John Nicholas Brown Center. Uh, he was named a number of years ago one of Granada's best young American novelists for his first book, A Case of Curiosities, uh, which recently has been reissued uh, on the occasion of his second book, been reissued by Harcourt. Uh, he's received fellowships from the Guggenheim and Fulbright Foundations and has uh, also uh, from the Center for Scholars and Writers uh, at New York Public Library. And I am very pleased that we can have him here in Washington for his first Washington appearance for this uh, bookish novel, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Alan Kurzweil. Alan? Uh, thank you, John. Um, I'm married to a uh, French woman, and uh, the French have an expression which says, uh, that in the presence of such uh, outrageous praise, one is uh, one runs the risk of having uh, swollen calves. And uh, <laughs> I think mine are about to burst uh, the legs of my pants. Nevertheless, uh, I will uh, happily embrace all those kind things that John said and uh, reciprocate with a couple of uh, Library of Congress reflections before I begin the only slightly more formal uh, conversation and then a very brief reading uh, that I will uh, do for the next 50 or so minutes. I hadn't thought that I, uh, I didn't think I have any connection to this building until about 20 minutes ago when John told me that the uh, catalog in publication offices were located here. For the non-librarians uh, in the audience, the CIP is the uh, uh, division of the Library of Congress uh, that catalogs uh, all the books that find their way into, uh, not only into the Library of Congress, but into the libraries throughout the United States. And they're the ones who designate the subject headings of uh, novels and works of nonfiction. Now, since my novel is uh, among other things, a, a, a love letter of sorts to libraries and librarianship, I thought it only made sense that the subject headings uh, embrace the kind of classification rigor that my characters display. Uh, it, so to that end, uh, I waited expectantly, uh, assuming that the office would diligently read the entire novel, have a couple of meetings to discuss what subject headings might be appropriate for the novel, uh, and then send along a handsome list uh, identifying the key subjects uh, that my characters, who uh, are besotted by any number of things, uh, explore in the course of the book. Uh, when the subject headings came back on the title page, uh, they included fiction and 
libraries. And uh, though that is, in fact, a fair assessment of two of the subjects the book addresses, uh, I thought, well, where's tattooage? Where's the history of watchmaking? Where's pop-up book design? Where is bibliocleptomania or theft of any kind? So I uh, immediately um, attempted to call this building and find out if we could possibly <laughs> discuss, modify, and expanding the list of subject headings. Uh, and that was uh, my entry into the world of uh, governmental scale. Uh, and after a lot of uh, speed dialing and uh, 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 you know, being put on hold and uh, pushing ones and pushing twos, I finally reached the voicemail for the woman whose entire career is devoted to publishing houses uh, with names that begin with the letter H. <laughs> and since my book is published by Hyperion, she was the one, or one of the, the, the front, front man, front person, for the team overseeing the H's at the Library of Congress uh, CIP division. And so uh, eventually I was able to communicate with her and she grudgingly said that if I sent the entire manuscript down again, along with my proposed subject headings, she would take a look at it, which I, uh, so I did. Uh, thankfully, I had my publisher's uh, FedEx account number, and uh, which has come in handy on many occasions in the last six months. So I sent an old version of the a draft down uh, with my 26, uh, I, I, I sort of narrowed it down to 26 subject headings. <laughs> and um, uh, I had a, a victory of sorts. Um, the book now uh, has not just libraries and not just uh, fiction, but they um, uh, added uh, Art Thefts New York, uh, Collectors and Collecting, and Bibliomania. So I actually do have a soft spot for, not only for the Library of Congress in general, but for this particular building because it displayed an uncharacteristic flexibility and responsiveness to a uh, admittedly somewhat uh, uh, headstrong novelist devoted to the library arts. Well, enough of a digression um, that runs the risk of pandering to the audience. I thought I would jump into the reason for tonight's talk, which will revisit the subject of libraries, um, but begin by talking about how I got interested in the, uh, the most obvious subject of this novel, The Grand Complication, and that is watchmaking in general, and more specifically, a single pocket watch that it, uh, graces the uh, cover of the book, uh, which uh, is a timepiece known by many names, uh, most famously the Marie Antoinette, but also known as the Perpetual, the number 160 for the true connoisseur of watchmaking who knows the log books of this watch's maker, Abraham Louis Breguet, and which is more generically known as the Grand Complication. Back in 1983, I was a struggling freelance writer piecing together a career and uh, an income of sorts by doing just about any assignment that came my way, which is why I found myself in a watch shop in Zurich listening to a rather dull disquisition about uh, uh, the nuances of pocket watch design uh, in the 18th and 19th century. And uh, it was given to me by a rather stiff Swiss watch dealer uh, who owned a shop and also a tremendous collection of pocket watches. And uh, while he was droning on about minute repeaters and chronographs and split seconds, uh, his phone rang and this man who I had for the last 20 or 30 minutes been about as stiff as a fondue fork slumped in his chair as a result of this phone call, went completely pale and uh, made it very clear that something terribly tragic had happened. And I thought, well, at this point, it's probably best to excuse myself. The, uh, uh, I'd obviously uh, uh, found myself in, in the midst of a, a rather uh, unpleasant situation. And he, 
He hung up and he said, no, 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 it's quite all right. And he, he regained a measure of composure and he said, I'm terribly sorry, but I just discovered that the queen uh, was stolen. And obviously I didn't know exactly what he meant and I, journalist that I was, probed him a little further, it didn't take much. And he explained that the greatest pocket watch made by the greatest of pocket watch makers, this aforementioned grand complication, had been stolen from a museum, a private museum in Jerusalem. And um, he said, he drew any number of parallels. I, it would be dishonest of me to tell you exactly what they were. I can't remember what they are, but you can uh, pull a masterpiece from your own passions, be they uh, visual arts or literature. Within the world of watchmaking and horology, the grand complication, Marie Antoinette, is the ne plus ultra the pocket watch to end all pocket watch design. And as I walked out of the man's store, I was, um, I was almost as shaken as he was simply by the, uh, the, the devastation that I had watched him uh, endure. And it perplexed me that someone could be so troubled by the loss of an inanimate object, one that wasn't even his. And so I decided, in a general sense, to, ex to, to try and understand what was so special about this watch and the man who made it. And so I started doing a great deal of library research. And I traveled to the watchmaking valleys of Switzerland, where many of the uh, watchmakers working today use exactly the same methods that were used back when this watch was first uh, started, back in 17. 83. And I traveled to Paris and looked at the log books of the watchmaker. Um, I went off to the Isle of Man and eventually I scraped together uh, uh, enough money and um, another journalistic gig that took me to the crime scene in Jerusalem. And I went to this private museum where uh, uh, the, collect the watch used to be and saw this pauperized collection of timepieces. And it was standing in front of a glass case that had a piece of crushed velvet and a faint hockey puck sized ghost mark where the queen once resided, that I decided there was a story here that warranted my attention. Why was there a story? Well, part of the reason um, is the brilliance of the man who designed this complicated timepiece. Abraham Louis Breguet is an interesting figure, not only for the genius of his design. If any of you have the opportunity to see his timepieces, you will discover that they are as modern as um, as pure in design as any uh, piece of Bauhaus furniture. And despite the fact that they were made in a period of tremendous Rococo flourish, they have a certain measure of restraint and, uh, and, and timeliness, uh, uh, appropriately enough. Um, coupled with that design genius was uh, an extraordinary story of a man clearly gifted in the domain of marketing. Uh, he was commissioned to make this watch for Marie Antoinette. He received that commission in 1703. The watch wasn't completed until long after the Queen's unfortunate decapitation. Uh, but when Breguet, who had been supplying watches to the royalty of France, saw his uh, client list evaporate uh, with that event known as the French Revolution, he quickly switched gears and started supplying timepieces to the Committee uh, for Public Safety, the revolutionaries uh, who overthrew the, uh, the king. Uh, a brief footnote in the history of timekeeping at the risk of sounding a little too uh, uh, enamored of, of timekeepers in the history of, of clocks and watches. The Committee of Public Safety in their attempt to reinvent the world, decreed soon after they took power, 
that not only would the calendar of the French Republic be reinvented so that the 12 month year was thrown out uh, and replaced by a 10 month year, but this decimania was also applied to timekeepers. And so with a stroke of a pen and a, a, a decree by the committee, the 24 hour day was turned into a 10 hour day. And each of the 10 hours would last 100 minutes and each minute would last 100 seconds. Now, obviously this was a welcomed declaration for the watchmakers of France. <laughs> and we saw there the possibility of uh, commissions uh, uh, doubling, or more than that, uh, you know, uh, growing exponentially overnight. Uh, unfortunately for them, the, uh, the idea, how clever it might have been in principle, was rejected within three months. However, there is one Breguet pocket watch, actually a, a desk watch is, is the technical term, that displays this revolutionary dial with the 10 hours and the 100 minutes and the 100 seconds. But Breguet, being Breguet, did something absolutely in keeping with his wiliness. One side of the pocket watch, which is about this big, has the revolutionary dial that pays tribute to the principle of the committee. But if you turn the watch over, the other face of this clock displays royal face with 12 hours. So this two-faced timepiece is a perfect expression of Breguet's ability to eat his cake and have it too, to cover all bases, to make sure that if one market was going to evaporate or be overturned, he still had the other one that he could supply watches to. Uh, this uh, continued on when Napoleon came to power, uh, with the prefatory comments I've been making, I needn't tell you who his primary watchmaker was. Breguet was supplying watches to not only to Napoleon, but to all of his generals. And uh, after doing a little bit of library research, I discovered uh, that Breguet expanded his client base even further. And uh, so by the time the Battle of Waterloo took place, he was not only supplying watches to Napoleon, but had uh, successfully obtained commissions from Wellington as well. <laughs> so I. Breguet, in a sense, represents in watchmaking what someone like uh, Jean-Louis David in painting uh, was able to do, namely uh, obtain commissions from each and every successive uh, political party that was in power for a period of about 40 years. Uh, well, I think that's enough about the, uh, the watchmaker. I'll tell you a little bit about the watch itself. Uh, I won't burden you with the uh, technical details of what makes this timepiece extraordinary. Uh, the word complication is a term used uh, by watchmakers to describe all those gizmos, bells, and whistles in addition to the regular uh, hour and minute hand that can be added to, uh, to a watch. So if you've ever seen a uh, uh, pocket watch that has one of those moon faces that rotates uh, uh, through its cycle, that's one complication. Uh, when uh, five such add-ons uh, are included in a watch, it is granted the designation grand complication. Uh, this one in particular, though commissioned for the Queen, wasn't completed until uh, 1823. It ended up in the collection of the first Jewish Lord Mayor of London, Sir David Solomons. And when he passed away, his only daughter, Vera, uh, smitten by a Zionist fervor, took the whole collection to Jerusalem. Um, again, I'm keen on footnotes in talks like this, even though they don't find their way into the books. Uh, Vera uh, is distinguished um, in the history of Zionism as uh, having attempted, unsuccessfully obviously, to buy the Western Wall. The, the Wailing Wall. <laughs> she, was, she was walking by and she saw a rabbi bent in prayer. And just at the moment that the, the, the rabbi was praying, uh, she saw a donkey urinate uh, against the wall right next to him. And she was so devastated by this desecration, she had contacted the British authorities in an attempt to buy the wall for 100,000 pounds sterling. When that plan was rejected. She devoted her energies to other projects, including uh, 
the construction of a private museum that celebrated her devotion to the two men in her life. Uh, the first was an Arabic scholar. Uh, her, I think the euphemism at the time was companion, uh, who collected a, a tremendous uh, a holding of Arabic art. And the other was her beloved father, uh, Sir David Lionel. And so she built this testimony to these two fellows, split the museum in half. Half was devoted to the Arabic art of Leon, and the other half was devoted to Sir David. And it was uh, from that museum that thieves stole the pocket watch that became the basis of my research. Now, in the course of doing that research, something curious happened. The inanimate object that had fascinated me at the outset suddenly started ticking, <coughs> excuse me, became quite animated, <coughs> mm, excuse me, uh, because of the help I had received from the librarians who had been so instrumental in providing the research, some of which I just told you. And I decided that the researchers themselves would become part of the story. And so I uh, cast as the narrator of this tale a reference librarian. Uh, because I decided, after having met any number of dynamic uh, uh, librarians, that there was a, uh, a void in the history of uh, librarians in fiction of truly dynamic, engaged uh, advocates. Um, the librarians I had met uh, repudiated the uh, hair in the bun, uh, marrying the librarian, music man soundtrack that many people outside the profession uh, seem to think of. Um, uh, the silent signs no longer exist in, in, in most libraries that, that I go to. And uh, the literature that I read produced by the reference librarians often embraced all sorts of, of tremendously substantive and important um, First Amendment uh, and constitutional issues. Uh, most recently, there was actually a fascinating piece, uh, I'll probably investigate it more closely, of a librarian down in Florida I'm sure some of you might have noticed this in the paper, who in balancing her attempts to protect the privacy of readers, which is a, a, uh, one of the, the, the many principles that reference librarians embrace, she was forced to balance that imperative with the one of national security because one of the uh, terrorists uh, in the September 11th attack had in fact used a public library and it uh, turned out that some of the uh, research trail uh, had possibility of being helpful in uh, the uh, investigation of the attack. Uh, that dynamic, that sort of political engagement was very much at the core of a lot of the research that I was doing uh, while writing the book. Uh, I was about two years into this uh, uh, exploration not only of watchmaking but librarianship, plowing through unbelievably tedious books published by, I hope I'm not insulting anyone here, published by the Scarecrow's Press, which is a press almost single-mindedly interested in library matters and which often seen, even to this day, has the whiff of the mimeograph machine, <laughs> even though technology has significantly advanced. Um, anyway. I culled a, a great deal of, of, of fascinating material from those publications and, and many others, as well as some uh, field research uh, with a number of informants at the New York Public Library. And then about a year and a half or two years into that research, I was uh, reading, uh, I think it was the New York Review of Books, and I noticed a big announcement for uh, a new fellowship uh, sponsored by the New York Public Library devoted to, uh, open to scholars, writers. They distinguished uh, those two categories, uh, which I'm, <laughs> is a, oh, thank you, yes, I'm a little bit of a cough here. Uh, so I uh, uh, 
I, I saw this notice for a fellowship that was certainly by novelist standards very handsomely paid, by li librarian standards, obviously, this goes without saying, also handsomely paid. And uh, the only sort of this, the primary criterion of this, uh, of this fellowship was that the applicant uh, had to display demonstrable need to use the resources of the library. Now, since I was in the midst of writing a novel about the New York Public Library, I thought this is the first and last time I'll ever truly be qualified for a grant that I might apply for. So I applied for it. I was lucky enough to get it. And when I was asked what it was like in the first couple of weeks of the fellowship to be given the opportunity to, to, to roam the New York Public Library, the analogy I gave was uh, uh, somewhat lofty. Uh, I said it was a, uh, somewhat like uh, the Wordsworth scholar being given the keys to Dove Cottage. Uh, but by the end of the fellowship, the analogy that I sort of found myself uh, embracing was more of the Elvis fan who was allowed to roam Graceland, because it was a, a much more sort of uh, 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 raucous, freewheeling um, uh, experience that, that, that had none of the sort of Tony hushed academic qualities that one might expect from such an august institution. And I think the only, <coughs> only thing that would have made it, possibly it could have made it any better, is if I had received the perk that the director of the New York Public Library used to receive up to about 1940, which was an eight-room apartment on the second floor mezzanine level uh, that allowed him to sleep in the library and work there as well. That no longer is a uh, part of the uh, benefits package of museum directors. Um, I was talking to a librarian here earlier who uh, pulled me aside and said, you know, how much of that material in your novel uh, is really based on the New York Public Library and how much of it is completely made up? And part of me wanted to sort of inverse the, the answer and to tell them that everything that was correct in the book was the fictional part and everything that was fictional was correct. But I'm not that subversive. And I thought I would tell you what I, I told um, this fellow. Uh, the zip tubes, uh, known more formally as uh, systems of pneumatic dispatch, uh, do exist. Uh, there are these wonderful and, uh, uh, me mechanical pneumatic contraptions that transmit little canisters of uh, call slips from the third floor reading room down to the stacks. Um, the little spacers, uh, these are uh, little pieces of wood that were cut in the carpentry shop uh, for many, many years and placed in spots on the shelves in the stacks uh, to represent those books that had gone missing in action. Uh, still exist, though they're not used with the same regularity. Uh, in fact, um, when they're not used, they tend to sort of pile up, uh, these wooden books sort of pile up in the corners of, of the stacks, and the, uh, the janitorial staff is always grumbling uh, a great deal about them. Um, the reading room is, in fact, three feet shy of a football field, and um, you know, there are any number of other details in the book. Uh, the temperament, the sort of subversive temperament of the librarians, I think, is absolutely consonant with some of the people I met at the reference desk. To my, uh, as far as I know, there's never been a chariot race around the exterior of the reading room. Uh, the catalog system there is not the one that I'll read a passage of, uh, uh, about in a few moments, which uh, is uh, um, is a Dewey system. Um, I don't think they've ever used their enunciator board, which is their number board, to play a uh, battleship. <laughs> they weren't able to supply me with a pop-up Kama Sutra, but I had my paper engineer in the novel make one anyway. Um, and uh, I think that that pretty much sort of summarizes the, the, the fiction and reality of my uh, of my time um, at the New York Public. Uh, 
Having said that, I can go on and on with similar footnotes about some of the characters in the novel based on, on real people. The complex and uh, uh, conflicted character of Melville doing being probably the most interesting, a man of tremendous principle who is also an outrageous bigot, a uh, fellow who is probably more than anyone else responsible for sort of the aspects of the democratic spirit of American librarianship being diffused throughout the country at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, but who also uh, uh, poisoned his cataloging system with any number of prejudicial subject headings. Um, the one that comes to mind, but by no means the most egregious, is one that uh, demanded that homosexuality be cross-referenced to perversion. Uh, it took many years and lots of committee meetings for uh, uh, people overseeing the Dewey system to have that cross-reference uh, corrected. Uh, in a similarly sinister fashion, he established a country club in his uh, downtime up in Lake Placid that had a restriction that was rigorous as the restrictions and classifications that he applied eventually to his catalogs. And it said that no Jews, blacks, consumptives, or other undesirables would be allowed on the grounds. Uh, so thanks to the Scarecrow Press and to any number of other uh, library resources, I was able to find a world that was much more complicated, much more engaging. Uh, in, uh, uh, in the world uh, when it came to librarians and librarianship. Well, I've run on quite a bit about those two passions and their relationship to each other, watchmaking and, and books. I thought, actually, I thought I was going to read for about 10 minutes, but I'm looking at the time now and am concerned that if I read for 10 minutes, then the question and answer session would be uh, uh, would be non-existent. And so I'm torn, selfishly, I prefer to stop now and open the floor to questions because it's that part of the dynamic that uh, I most welcome. Uh, if there's a collective groan that requires the author to read a section of his book, <laughs> I can certainly do that. Uh, speaking as a uh, reader and a listener in such gatherings, even in those contexts when I have uh, been passionately uh, fascinated by the works of novelists, I've never found readings to be, uh, to be as enthralling as the works have been for me as a reader when I read them to myself. Uh, the most obvious example I can give uh, was the experience I had uh, when I uh, heard Robertson Davies, uh, a wonderful Canadian writer no longer alive, who himself has a, is a much better reader than I am, a, has a background in, uh, in theater. And he gave a tremendous reading. And yeah, he's got he's this, this larger-than-life figure with a beard that goes halfway down his, uh, his torso. And even though I loved the book that he was, uh, uh, from which he was reading, and even though he gave a tremendous presentation, it wasn't, didn't capture the same it, uh, sort of excitement that I had managed to generate uh, for myself as a reader. So I've actually answered my own question. I think I'm going to uh, uh, stop here and hope that uh, my uh, musings, or whatever you want to call them, might trigger a question or two or three, uh, and respond. Much to the irritation of my publishers, who were hoping that it would be recovered within the six weeks that the book <laughs> has been published, it's still gone missing. And there have been, there have been discussions about uh, re initiating a, an aggressive search for an uh, attempt at its recovery. Sadly, when the watch was stolen, the guards on hand were sleeping, the alarm system was disconnected, there was no insurance, and when there's no insurance on a valuable object, the investigation 
just stops because it's the financial incentive on the part of the insurers that generally prompts an aggressive pursuit of uh, uh, an attempt at recovery. So <coughs> the library, excuse me, the museum itself doesn't have the resources to subsidize that. The watch company that bears the name Breguet might do that. Uh, I was all keen uh, on coming up with some outrageously big reward, uh, but I wasn't going to bankroll that personally, and no one else has, so that's the long answer. Yeah? I'm good. My question is, if you're good about the watch itself, or is it more than the watch? Um, it's certainly more than about watches. It uses watches to tell a story of a theft, and then uh, not just of watches, but of theft of ideas and of identity, if I sort of at the risk of being a little bit too uh, sort of thematic and, and academic in my explanations of what the book is trying to do. Uh, but at the heart of it, I, I hope, it's a book that is a search much the way the Maltese Falcon or any number of other uh, heist-based narratives might be. It's just a a story that's uh, uh, interested in, in bringing two or three characters together to, to tell a, a good tale. That's, that's, that's sort of one of my notes. Uh, you talk about second idea. Is it like one of your or others? I'm sorry, is it like? Is it like one or others? I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know how to answer that question exactly. Um, if you can rephrase it, maybe I have a better, uh, what I, better. What I mean by second idea, is you read how they, how they like stealing ideals and for themselves. Oh, yes. Um, the book focuses on uh, the relationship between a librarian that I discussed and a collector who I didn't discuss at all. Uh, the collector commissions this librarian to investigate the disappearance of the watch. But in the course of the novel, it becomes clear to the librarian that this collector is not just interested in recovering the stolen timepiece, but he's interested as in well in stealing bits and pieces of the librarian who's helping him find the watch. For me to describe it in those terms makes it a little bit complicated, not necessarily grand, but um, it's, uh, it's as much uh, uh, an exploration of how people often relate to the inanimate, to bring the conversation right back to the very beginning of the talk, how they relate to these objects that have no pulse to them, that may tick but which don't have a heart, and how they invest those objects with tremendous emotion, tremendous feeling. It's a, it's, a, it's a liability that many collectors have, whether they collect books or pocket watches or um, you know, uh, works by Andy Warhol. Uh, yeah, I'm oh, sorry. No, I, the great thing, the uh, great thing, no, uh, you can see it's, um, this watch, it's very rare that I take it off. Uh, it's a more expression of my laziness than anything else. Uh, and I only do it when I run the risk of running over, in a which I uh, risk I run regularly. Uh, no, I, I have, both in the first book and in this one, been uh, very keen on very bizarre, very costly environments involving collectors of mechanical automatons and pocket watches. And, uh, and I'm happy, actually, to inhabit those spaces and play with those toys on the page. And it costs a lot less to build a library in a novel than it does in your home. And it's much easier for me to collect the grand complication and other timepieces on behalf of my characters as a novelist than it would be uh, to do so uh, uh, in actual ways. And also, it's much easier to uh, 
get rid of the collection once it's uh, once my interest wanes, which it does. Yeah, that, the, the, there is a relationship. The nature of that relationship has troubled reviewers immensely because the standard vocabulary of sequel or follow-up, whatever, is not correct. It misrepresents the relationship. If anything, this book is a repudiation of the first book. <laughs> but it is related in this way that any repudiation has to be related to the thing which is being repudiated. Uh, the first book, A Piece of Curiosities, uh, chronicles the life of a mechanical genius in the 18th century through a collection of objects under glass. The case in question has ten compartments. Only nine of those ten compartments are filled with objects representing decisive moments in this fellow's life. The final compartment, that tenth compartment, is left empty in the first novel. And so uh, when the book came out, first one, a journalist asked me, well, what's, what's next? Which is the obligatory question that all journalists ask, writers. And uh, to deflect the question, which all writers tend to find tremendously annoying, I said uh, flippantly, well, maybe I'll spend the next few years trying to figure out what that empty compartment contained. <laughs> and I was cursed uh, to do exactly that. So I had this empty compartment. Uh, that needed an object in it, and I had been pursuing this incredible object that needed a home. So I put the Grand Complication Pocket Watch in the Case of Curiosities. Then I took the Case of Curiosities, the novel, and placed it in the Grand Complication, the novel. So, definitely buy the other book. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And if, and, I would even recommend, let's see, how could I further <laughs> increase sales? <laughs> no, I, I don't think I can, actually. No, that, I, absolutely. And, uh, or I suppose you can just take it out of the library. It's, it's, I think that's what my actors would say. Yeah. When you're a novel that requires so much detailed research, how do you know when you're Well, uh, first of all, I'm not sure I'm very good at resisting the urge. Uh, I have, and uh, the urge, when is enough, uh, is a question that all writers, but this one in particular, has to ask not only in the research, but also then in the writing. And uh, the most telling and painful example of, of how uh, incapable I am in answering that question uh, efficiently is that when I'm walking upstairs at the moment, I've managed, I'm sort of putting this book behind me. The residue of this book still uh, troubles me in the form of six file boxes that are stacked up on the third floor of my house, which are old drafts of this book and assorted research. And I don't know really what to do with it. I was sort of trash most of it and get rid of it. sort of resistant. Someone else said, no, don't get rid of it. You might want to go back. I don't have the kind of ruthlessness I think it would be good to have. Uh, I didn't expect to be um, as interested as I was in the subject. Uh, I, I think that, that um, the question, I, I, I'm asking myself the exact same question now as a, as a writer having spent uh, close to six years on the first book and um, nine years. Uh, separate the publication of the first and the second. Obviously, I, I asked myself that very question. And obviously, my publisher and editor asked the same question with a little more urgency. Um, and the answer that I have been starting to, to provide, my, it's not an answer, but it's a, it's a, uh, a means by which to perhaps uh, contradict my son Max's observation, which I'll tell you in a second, is to think about whether I lose some immediacy and narrative spontaneity in the methods I use as a novelist 
And I say that having written and rewritten and rewritten my book so many times, I suspect that the version that was published, I certainly hope that the version that was published is superior to draft four uh, and superior to draft five. But what I suspect is the truth is that draft one was obviously not pretty good. And I probably rewrote the novel three or four times without improving it. And it was the penultimate draft, which was helped by my editor, that actually elevated it to, to and reduced it and distilled it to the form that, that ultimately then was published in the final version. So if I can get rid of those three middle sections or four middle sections, I'll save a few years. And so uh, the answer to your question is that, unfortunately, the writer doesn't know often when enough is enough. And um, I suspect in the same way that there are probably lawyers who are brilliant in researching precedent and all the rest, but don't know where efficiency necessitates stopping the refinement of a particular argument because you lose the, the energy you need to argue your case. And uh, a work of fiction is in part arguing a case, and you need to retain that kind of energy. Oh, yeah, my son, I've got this son, just, you know, it's further proof that our children are never like us. Um, uh, he's got math skills that are beginning to exceed mine. He's eight, or he's about to be eight, so it's so more an indictment of my inabilities than an endorsement of his. But he said, uh, a while back, he, he was looking at me, he said, you know, rather smugly, he said, you know, Daddy, it took you six years to write the first book and nine years to write the second. I've figured out how long it's going to take for you to write your third book. So uh, I'm going to uh, hope to disprove my little brat's calculations, uh, in part by figuring out a, a, a way of accelerating the process while retaining the energy and the, the enthusiasm. So uh, uh, I hope to be here in six or seven months to discuss my, <laughs> my third book, but we'll see. Um, yes to both questions. Uh, I generally have one of those, they're not so much eureka moments as these kind of meditative days where this, these free-floating passions find expression in list form on a page. And then uh, there'll be maybe be some keywords, some, some characters, some scenes, telegraphically scribbled down, and maybe arrows pointing the possible order. And that's the basis of the book. And that allows me to um, dupe myself into believing I have the capacity to write a novel. And through that uh, self-deception, I'm able to create enough energy then to actually create a draft. Then when the draft is done, I, I see all sorts of uh, missed opportunities or uh, uh, excesses, uh, you know, so f third arms that can be, you know, amputated or, uh, you know, it's missing a heart, so that has to be revisited. Uh, they, so it's, it's a sort of Frankenstein effort, but it begins with a, with a, uh, uh, a presumption that the book can be done. That, that's the, been the case in the, in the first and second. But uh, my methods may change uh, for the third. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there are actually many more, but there's, uh, the uh, question is if, if there are two or three characters in the book. No, there, there are, there, there's a card catalog of characters. There are reference librarians. There's a conservator who's devoted to the protection of books rather than the dissemination of knowledge. Um, 
I don't want to sort of be grossly simplistic about the taxonomy of librarianship, but uh, why not? Uh, there's, um, generally speaking, there are those librarians who are devoted to uh, communicating, to helping people help themselves uh, understand whatever it is that brings them to the library. It doesn't matter if it's a local branch library or Library of Congress. And uh, they're the ones who inspired uh, uh, Toni Morrison uh, t uh, uh, when she was a little girl uh, going into a local branch or uh, the likes of um, Simon Shama when he's doing a research on the history of Britain. Uh, then there are those librarians who see themselves as protectors of the printed word and treat the reader uh, as the enemy of, of, of uh, the things that they are there to protect. The novel has one character in the form of a fellow named Grote who is one of those protectors uh, who would more happily see the spine of a reader be broken than one of his precious <laughs> books be damaged. I happen to be much more attracted, though people like Grote make for wonderful caricature, I tend to be more attracted to those advocates that you see at the reference desk who say, come on and let you pass through the swing gate and take you to the stacks. Uh, there's a fellow no longer at the library, at the New York Public Library, who did exactly that before I had the fellowship named Rob Rucker. And Rob was wonderful uh, in not only transmitting the passion for libraries, but uh, uh, expressing just how weird a place a library can be. And he quit his job about two years ago and ended up switching careers. And uh, when I told uh, uh, someone who knew him vaguely what he had gone into, they thought, well, that's the most bizarre career choice I've ever heard of. And on the face of it, uh, it, it would seem to be a, a rather dramatic about face. Uh, he went from being a reference librarian at the New York Public Library to a Peace Corps volunteer in East Africa. But in fact, I think that his career change was actually a continuation of the energy that he brought to the job as a librarian. And um, he wanted to help people figure out how it was, uh, how to get things done or answer questions that they needed answering. And I think that that kind of spirit um, is present in the Peace Corps volunteer and uh, in the reference librarian who's doing his job with a kind of vigor and uh, engagement that Rob uh, displayed constantly. So. Well, it depends who you talk to. No, certainly no one in the family, I mean, no one in the family is going to acknowledge any resemblance between the character of Nick in the novel and Françoise in my personal life. Uh, for anyone who's read the book, uh, there's a great deal of um, sexual hijinks and, um, and, uh, uh, and, and sexual frustration. Um, happily, that is, enters the world of uh, fiction, as does the, the career uh, professional pursuits of the characters. They're both French, but the character of Nick in the novel is a paper engineer and a designer of these erotic pop-up books, including a pop-up Kama Sutra and a bunch of other extraordinary book, uh, three-dimensional books. Uh, my wife uh, has no less interesting uh, uh, professional life. Uh, she is a, an anthropologist who specializes in Australian Aboriginal culture and specifically in the ritual life of women in the central Australian desert. Um, and so, uh, uh, happily, uh, I can identify why it is that they're different. That doesn't stop any number of people at cocktail parties tapping my wife, Francoise, on the shoulder and saying, Nick, how are you doing? Which <laughs> drives her crazy. I think that our time is up. Our time is up, but our, all of our time isn't up. We still have a chance to uh, talk to Alan personally, to get a book signed if he would like that.
and to have some conversation uh, before our evening is over. But let me right now uh, ask you to join me in thanking Alan Kurzweil for not only a wonderful presentation, but for presenting to us the spirit and the energy in person that comes through in his books. Alan, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Join us outside and we'll get um, Alan whatever you would like to eat or drink and he will be signing out by the, the table where the books are being signed. Sold. Signed and sold. Sold and sold. Right. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.